Hello everyone, the Hockey News Podcast returns. We are closing out our season divisional previews for 2019-20 with the Pacific Division. It's Matt Larkin here with Ken Campbell on the left, Ryan Kennedy on the right. And fellas, I want to say we're, we're going out with a bang here, but uh, I don't think that would be true. I think the Pacific is uh, the worst division in the NHL. Do you agree or disagree? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree wholeheartedly. No. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's definitely a little top heavy and even the top is not necessarily as intimidating as some of the other divisions. It's gonna, that's going to go over really well with all the people that say, you guys have an East Coast bias. And I, I open the podcast with Rip in the Old West. <laughs> uh, okay. We're going to start at the top of the division with our predictions. Same format as the past three podcasts. First place is the first team we're going to cover. We're going to have three burning questions for each team. And we're starting with the team that won the Western Conference standings, at least in the regular season, Calgary. We have them predicted to finish first again. Uh, I guess let's start with goaltending because we knew uh, it was a problem last year, uh, or at least it was an area of uncertainty. And the Flames, even though David Riddick was the starter for much of the year, they didn't have confidence in him Mm -hmm. in crunch time. They went to Mike Smith. Mike Smith's gone. Now it's Cam Talbot in as the backup. So I guess the first way I can phrase it is, is Cam Talbot in there to be a backup or is he a threat to David Riddick's job? I don't think he is. I I I I think if he is, then the Flames are in a lot of trouble. I think that David Riddick has to be their number one guy, and he has to be consistent this year. He was he was good for long periods of time last year, but then he lost his job by the time the playoffs came, and Mike Smith was the number one guy. I, I don't think you can envision that happening again and seeing the Calgary Flames have any sort of level of sustained uh, success. Mm. I, I think I could see Cam Talbot taking that job. We've seen good Cam Talbot in the mm. recent past, and you have to remember – the defenses he was playing behind in Edmonton, they weren't very good. Right. Whereas in Calgary, he's going to have Mark Giordano, TJ Brody, Travis Hamanick, Noah Hannafin. I mean, they've, they've got a really solid top four, and they have some very responsible forwards. So for me, like with Riddick, I, I think a lot of his early success was because nobody knew who he was. And once NHLers had a, had a book on him, things tilted a little. And I, I don't see that getting necessarily better as time goes on. With Talbot, I think that you bring him in as a challenger and you're happy if he usurps Riddick. And to me, that's kind of the best case scenario for the Flames is that they have an honest to goodness competition in the crease this year. And speaking of not knowing who David Riddick is, do we know that it's Riddick or is it Riddick? I say Riddick, but I've heard people say Riddick. And now I, I'm let's kind of call the whole thing off. <laughs> yeah, like which do we know for sure that he's Riddick? I'll admit, for the first like eighty percent of the season, I thought he was Swiss, and he's actually from the Czech Republic. He's a Czech. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. He's one of those guys. If you don't hear his name spoken aloud enough, then they, I, I just am not totally confident. David, David, da- <laughs> David Reitaik. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, but it's interesting. I, I was speaking to a former NHL goalie last week uh, about Cam Talbot. He came up in conversation, and what the goalie was saying was that Talbot. You know, he had that great year a few years ago where he finished fourth in Vezina voting, but the workload he had, the shots he was facing, it, it wasn't sustainable. And eventually he imploded in Edmonton, and what happened was he lost his confidence. So yeah. that's why I don't see Talbot as an immediate threat to steal the number one job because we don't know yet that he has that confidence back. I also think that Riddick was not as bad as, as he was portrayed to be. If you go deeper into those numbers, he was at least a league average goalie, maybe even slightly above average the entire body of work last season. So he's someone that I think deserves a bigger shot, and I'm surprised. I was actually surprised that Calgary didn't give him even a game. So, like, Mike Smith was pretty decent for some of the, the first yeah. round against Colorado, but he wasn't so consistently awesome that they couldn't have given Riddick a shot. Um, but overall, my prediction is that one year ago, or sorry, one year from today, Braden Holtby is Calgary's starting goaltender. Ooh. Oh, goodness. That's wow. my prediction, like that. okay? Bookmark it. Okay. Uh, prediction. Question number two. So we know, we know what happened <coughs> to Calgary last year against Colorado, suddenly badly overmatched. And I think it's something that you've touched on before, Ken, where the central team, you know, it, it creates these weird on paper where it looks like a mismatch, yeah, but it's actually yeah. closer. Even though Colorado was an eight seed, they're coming out of the central, much tougher opponent against the Pacific team, Calgary, and Colorado was bigger, stronger, and faster. So looking at the Flames roster for 2019-20, we don't see too many significant moves. You know, you're bringing in Milan Lucic for some brawn. Who knows how much he has left in the tank. Uh, but do you guys think the Flames have done enough to fix what were their deficiencies last year? I mean, if we're going off, are they faster than 
No. <laughs> if anything, they're slower. Uh, they got heavier with Lucic, and you know, I mean, Matthew Kachuk for me is going to be a key driver yeah. on this team. We know that the Goudreau line is going to get you offense, but it feels like Kachuk is that kind of all-around nuisance, high-end player that can really change a game, you know, night in and night out. And if he's the guy that's kind of steering the bus, then I have a lot more hope for the Flames. Not only, I mean, in the regular season, they're going to be fine. Because as we alluded to, you know, it's, it's not a really competitive division. Right. It's all about the playoffs. And Matthew Kachuk is a playoff-type performer, even though he is just in the beginnings of his NHL career. And I, I think, too, his, his skill level is underrated. It is. Yeah. Like, he has got top-shelf skills, like elite, elite-level skills. Yeah. Um, and, and when he shows them, he's, he can be a real, uh, like the wow factor is just, is just amazing. Um, I, th- I think that we, you know, we talked about it off the top about this division, right? And I think part of the problem is, is that, is that th- things get skewed because of the, 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 the poor quality of this division. Mm. So teams that you think are better than they actually are, like teams might be a little better or not as good as you actually think they are because they're playing in such a weak division. So I think I think that hurts because you play the whole year, you know, the majority of your games against, you know, subpar competition and then boom, the playoffs are completely different and I think that's mm-hmm. what happened to happened to Calgary last year because as that series went on, I th- I think Calgary won game 1 in overtime and then after that it was just like boom. It yeah. Was just, yeah, so um, I, you know, I mean, and, and they haven't done much, but they, they probably don't need to do much to, to do really well in this division. Um, on the one hand, you know, you, you, you sort of don't have to worry about killing yourself to make the playoffs. On the other hand, then you wonder if you're good enough when you stack up against the other teams in the league. Right, and it sort of ties to the third question, which is just <coughs> sort of more big picture. And, you know, we know who Calgary is. They're going to be pretty good offensively again. They've got two really strong forward lines. They've got a nice deep defense core. They were good even without great goaltending last year, so we know that theoretically shouldn't be a problem this time. They've got a great coach, Bill Peters. But can this team get any better? They didn't change much. And so looking at the big picture, do you think this Flames team is capable of going on a deep run this year? Or are you just thinking, this is going to be a repeat of last year? I kind of lean toward the latter. Well, is, you know, I mean, is Sean Manahan going to get better? Is J- Johnny Gaudreau going to get better? Like, or have they hit their ceilings? Mm. Right, uh, 99 you know, points I, you, for yeah, Gaudreau. Yeah, so, you know, do they, do, do, does, the, does the improvement come from within? We know Matthew Kachuk's going to be better because yeah. he, he just seems to be going like this. And, yeah. and so he's going to obviously be a big guy. Mark Giordano is probably not going to get any better. He had a career year last year and was amazing, but he's 37 years old. So he's likely not going to get better. Um, you know, I, the goaltending. Is, is David Rich ready to take that step and become, you know, get himself into maybe a top 10 position in the league? I, I don't even know if that's possible. Or, you know, a top... 15 even. Well, he's probably he's probably middle of the road right now, yep. which puts him uh, somewhere 15, 16. You know, can he vault himself up into that top 10? Yeah, and, you know, you look at some of the young guys. Uh, the big thing is Yusuf Alamaki starting the season on the shelf. That's really tough for yeah, the Flames the because he would have been great in that top six defense core. It would be really nice to see what he could do. And obviously now they're going to have to wait and, and be patient, really, because he is one of their top prospects. And, yeah, otherwise, you got a lot of guys that are in their prime years already and have been. I guess there's something to say for continued chemistry, but I agree, Ken. I mean, there's definitely some, some X factors, you know, Giordano's production being one of them. <laughs> Elias Lindholm was last year the real Elias Lindholm, yeah. and, and this is, you know, obviously positive mm-hmm. news for the mm-hmm. Flames. Uh, or was that a bit of an aberration? I, I think that's another huge question. Otherwise, you're looking at a, a pretty good team that looks like a very good team based on... And, and a lot of guys, as you say, Matt, is we know what they are. Mm-hmm. Like, we, we know what Sam Bennett is. Mm. You know, we know what Michael Froelich is. We know what Michael Backlund is. We, you know, I mean, uh, barring some kind of really unforeseen thing, we, you know what you're going to get from those guys. Mm. Right. And the thing about the <coughs> Flames is, you know, they're a team that they've been reasonably successful or they've traded picks and... They don't have a ton of 
really elite top end prospects coming up from within. I'm talking mm -hmm. guys, well, I mean, Valimaki was probably the closest thing, but of course he's on the shelf. Yeah. So if you don't have that, you have to be like a Tampa Bay or Pittsburgh that has a, a great farm system and develops guys that are sort of slipping through the cracks into surprisingly impactful players. Your right. Tyler Johnsons, your Connor Shearies. Yeah. And if you look at the Flames lineup, they have not done a tremendous job of squeezing production out of those types of guys. It's like, you know, like Johnny Gaudreau came from the college system and he was already going to be a star. Monaghan was a first round pick. Lindholm was a trade. Kachuk first round pick, Backlund first round pick, pick for all league assigning, it goes on and on. Mm -hmm. Calgary doesn't have the reputation as a team that finds these gems on the farm. So I'm not that confident that we're going to get some surprise player coming up, uh, especially because that top six can be tough to crack. So I don't know. I think it's what we see is what we, we get with Calgary, which is a good team, but I don't think top, top tier Stanley Cup contender. Mm. I think that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew, Andrew Mangiapan. Yeah, I was going to say that, Exception yeah. to the rule. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he, he, was, he was a good fun. Good, but yeah. again, it's not like, he's not in the tier of right. Andre Pallad yeah, or Tyler yeah, Johnson, yeah. you know, yeah. those kind of guys. Uh, and interestingly, you know, in our, in our magazine, the season preview magazine, uh, we do uh, put some teams lower in the standings, even though we have them going further in the playoffs. And number two in the division, the Vegas Golden Knights, and this is the team that we actually have going to the Stanley Cup final because we think they're better engineered for playoff hockey than the Calgary Flames. Uh, and let's start with a guy that I, I think is arguably uh, their star now, Mark Stone, the mm -hmm. right winger, the best two-way right winger in the game, uh, one of the best defensive forwards of his generation. And, and do you guys think now, uh, after seeing what Mark Stone did in the playoffs, which is quite a dominant performance, is it possible he has another rung on the ladder? Or are we at peak Mark Stone now? Mm. I, I feel like... We're, we're at peak Mark Stone, but it's a, it, it's a really good level. Yeah. And, you know, he, he's not going to be a 50-goal guy by any stretch of the imagination, but, like, you know, 35 to 40, I think. And a Selkie trophy. That's fair. Yeah, yeah a Selkie yeah, trophy yeah, that, consideration. That's, that's elite level in the NHL. To be able to do that, for sure. Yeah, Stone, Stone, I voted Stone first place for the Selkie last year because he's the best takeaway artist in the entire sport. Mm -hmm. And what's crazy about Stone is if you watch him live, he's not he's not just doing like the Datsuk steal the puck. He intercepts the puck. He, he drops back like a defensive back and he catches pucks. Well, that's mm -hmm. because that's it's that's crazy. because he's using it with his that's because he's doing it with his brain, not his feet. Because yeah. he's not he's not a He's not an elite level skater. No. So he's doing it by angling and, and outthinking people most of the time. And I, I mean, a, his age would suggest that this is probably as good as it's going to get. Um, and if you can get a couple of years of that, that's amazing. Totally. For sure. <laughs> and, and to me, it adds a, a, an interesting dynamic because Vegas has had this great under Jar Gallant. You know, a deep forward group that's really hard working. But even if you go back to the, you know, the the first year with William Carlson getting 43 goals, I still think you know Vegas's first line, which was very good, might have been a second line on a super elite team. Mm. But now you've got two bona fide scoring lines, and, and then and then your third line, you have guys like Alex Tug, and then you know Cody Glass has been very interesting in the preseason. If he can stick, uh, we don't know officially if he's going to stick as of the recording of this podcast, uh, but. I think they've added a lot, and, and their, their ceiling now as a forward core is raised. But what about on defense? Uh, you know, you lose Colin Miller mm -hmm. uh, via trade in the offseason because there are some cap constraints uh, for Kelly McCrimmon. Uh, and now you have a group that, you know, is sort of workmanlike. You have your John Merrills, your Braden McNabb, your Derek Engeland, and you have good puck movers in Nate Schmidt and Jose Theodore, or <laughs> Shea <laughs> Theodore, <laughs> Jose. He wishes. Uh, but do you think this group is good enough, that defense core? Do they have enough depth? I think they do, and you know, you talk about the loss of Colin Miller, but um, you know, he wasn't huge before he got to yeah. Vegas. He was part of that workmanlike crew, uh, although you could kind of see it when he was in Boston that there was something there uh, as a puck mover. But I, I'm still really intrigued with this Vegas defense because they have that great internal competition where. You can't sit back because there are guys that are going to take your spot. And I think that goes all the way back to that expansion draft when they had so many defensemen at their disposal and they were able to have that competition. It's been a really fun camp for Vegas because they have a couple of guys coming up through the ranks uh, that are really pushing for spots. You know, we know Nick Haig, yeah. who's got great size and has really improved his skating uh, since his junior time with OHL Mississauga. But also Dylan Coughlin, who kind of came out of nowhere. Um, you know, this was a kid that no one had talked about. Played for Tri-City in the WHL. 
had some very nice offensive numbers from the back end when he was playing for the Americans. And, you know, after a good season with Chicago Wolves, he now comes into Vegas camp, starts turning heads, and all of a sudden you have yet another defenseman that you have to consider for a spot. And I just think that when you can have so many different parts moving in and out, it's such a benefit. And it, it just feels like that's Vegas's um, personality overall. It's, with the exception of Stone and Pacioretty, it's like, we're the Golden Knights. You might not be able to pick us out of a lineup if we didn't have our numbers on our jerseys, but we're all pretty good. We're all pretty yeah. quick. And we, we're, you know, we're a four-line, three-pairing team. Try and stop us. Yeah, and I mean, that's a, that's a good point you bring up. I mean, they, they, they tend to use everybody, right? Mm -hmm. And so then you do have to look at guys like Nick Haig and Darryl, uh, Derek England and guys like that to see what they can do because that's going to be your bottom, the bottom of your, your you, you know, that's going to be your bottom pair either, you know, probably guys like that. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, I mean, they are going to get, they're going to get like significant, not significant roles, but they're going to be out. They're going to be out against, you know, third lines and mm -hmm. second lines. And, and they're going to, they're going to play, you know, reasonable numbers of minutes. So, um, I mean, their top four is pretty solid. And if they have to, if they have to shorten it and lean on those guys, um, those are four pretty good guys to have to lean on. So I, I would say their defense core, it's not great. It's probably better than the sum of its parts, mm -hmm. which, yeah. I, which I think uh, makes it decent. For sure. It, it actually <coughs> reminds me a bit of what the Pittsburgh Penguins deployed when they won their two straight cups in 16 and 17, yeah. mm. which is, you know, not absolutely elite in skill, but guys that are capable of moving the puck quickly. So, like, you know, like Nate Schmidt. Nate Schmidt's never going to be a 60-point guy, but he might skate like a 60-point guy. Mm. He's very fast. And these guys can get the puck up quickly to a group of forwards that plays really fast and yeah. aggressive. And I like to call Vegas's forecheck like the hornet's nest. And it kind of reminds me of the way Pittsburgh did it. Just move that puck quickly, stretch passes, that kind of stuff. Uh, so I, I think it is pretty effective. Um, and of course, it's especially effective when you have a good goaltender. We know Marc-Andre Fleury had some injury concerns with yeah. concussions, but if you look at the body of work over two seasons with Vegas, he's very much back to being one of the most important and best goalies in the league. Uh, the question is, as he gets into his mid-30s now, how many, how many more seasons can he do it? And will those injury problems eventually come into play? Does Vegas have to be careful managing his workload? Yeah, I mean, you, you better hope it's three more good years because he start, he's, he's starting on a three-year contract right now. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, the injuries are a concern, without question. I mean, there's not much you can do about concussions. There's not much. I mean, you either get them or you don't. You get hit. You get hit by pucks. You get hit by players. That kind of thing. Um, there's not a lot you can do to really prevent those from happening. Um, but the only thing I worry about with Vegas is there's there's virtually no safety net. Mm. There really is. Yeah, all due respect there, to yeah, Malcolm Suman. Yeah, yeah. There, there's really no backup. <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's not a UC Saros. There's no backup yeah. plan. Yeah. It's so, not like you have a UC Saros um, back. Yeah. So you yeah. you better hope. I mean. Mark andre Fleury is really, really mentally strong, right? He went through all that stuff in Pittsburgh, um, and he's, he's really worked on, you know, being a really sort of mentally strong guy who doesn't let little things seem to bother him. So I, I don't think it'll be performance-related, but I, I do share your concern about the injuries. Mm. I will <laughs> say, as a goaltender, he has a bit of an advantage that – even though he turns 35 in November, we've seen goaltenders be successful in their late 30s. And I, I guess it's just you know a, a matter of the position itself where you're doing lots of skating back and forth, but not necessarily you know, a lot of uh, you know, all up the ice. And I, I think he can be good for the next three years. I, I think he's shown that. And yeah, injuries are definitely a concern. But as long as he's healthy, I mean... Like you said, he's been through it all. So nothing phases him. You know, uh, doing a survey for an upcoming article I'm doing for the magazine, you know, I had a player tell me he's still the best goalie in the league when it comes to breakaways. Mm -hmm. And again, we're talking about a guy that turns 35 and, ha and has had a long NHL career because he was yeah. young yeah. when he first joined the Pittsburgh Penguins. Yeah. So that's, yeah. I mean, that's why Marc-Andre Fleury is a guy that you have to consider for, 
getting into the, the wins record all time because he's been around for so long, played for so many good teams, and he's still good now. So it'll be fun to see how, how far he can go. And, I mean, you're right. Vegas needs to build up that pipeline. Boy, do they ever. They've right? only like had they, a couple they, of drafts. They've got they got to find and develop somebody. Like, yeah. Big time. Fast, I was quick. surprised, like, because Maxim <laughs> Zhukov was a draft pick, but, uh, you know, he's not with the organization anymore. And they got Yuri Patera, who they drafted. He's playing in the WHL right now. Um, they, have, they have options. Uh, or is it USHL? He might actually be in the USHL now. But uh, anyways, they're, they're getting a couple of options, but they definitely need to continue to draft because they have that, you know, lack of a head start on other organizations. Mm-hmm. For sure. Uh, you know what? I'm actually a bit more worried than you guys are about Fleury, um, even though I, I think he probably has at least one more good year in him. But the style of play that he, that he has, he's an athlete. Very goal. athletic, yeah. And mm-hmm. if you look at goalies yep. whose careers have, have aged really gracefully, the guy I always think about is Ed Belfour. And... I always say, did you ever see Ed Belfour make a save like this? Belfour was, he was a positional goal, Very right? efficient, He was yeah. super economic in his movements, and Fleury is an athlete. And a- as we've seen with a guy we're going to talk about later, Jonathan Quick, if you're an athlete and if you build your style on athleticism, when it goes, your game can go quickly. So mm-hmm. I worry with Fleury that one of these years, again, I don't think it's going to be this year, but it yeah. could be next year or the year after, I think the game could just, boom, be gone quickly because of the fact that athleticism is his game and also just the position and this is another it's for an upcoming story so I'm, I'm trying not to give too much away but another conversation I had with the goalie last week uh, just talked about how the game has changed just in the last couple seasons with the slashing crackdown the game is more east-west yeah. skill players move around a lot more so goalies have to do so much more movement so much more getting up and down and that's why you're having like younger goalies get hip labrum tears early in their careers etc cetera, etc cetera. so the position, I think, takes a lot more out of the body now. Uh, and that's another strike against Fleury in the long run. So, I don't know. I think this year, fine. <laughs> but I think the lack of a, of a safety net is, a, to me, a major problem for Vegas. <laughs> At third in the Pacific Division, we have a team that I would call very depleted. The San Jose Sharks. If you look at the losses in the offseason, Joe Pavelski is gone. Gustav Nyquist is gone. Junas Donskoy is gone. And the replacements, pretty much nobody. You know, unless you count guys like Dalton Prout on defense or Johnny Brodzinski, it was a quiet offseason for the Sharks because they just had no choice. They needed to focus on re-signing Timo Meyer and Kevin LeBanc and Joe Thornton. Um, so do you guys think that these personnel losses are going to be too catastrophic for the Sharks? And should we, should we be worried about them even as, as a playoff contender right now? No, because of the back end. I, I don't. I don't. I don't think you're ba- you're a bad team when you have the, a back end like they have. Mm. It, it just it's it's too difficult to be bad <laughs> when yeah. you have guys that are that good on defense. And those are going to be the guys that drive a lot of the offense. Either in, in if you're Brent Burns by scoring goals, or Eric Carlson by getting the puck up and getting it out of your zone and out of trouble. So I, I still like the team. I st- I I mean. They're good, not great, which is what San Jose is a lot. I, I think I don't think they're a, I don't think they're a legitimate like top Stanley Cup contender. Mm. Um, but that being said, you know, I mean, once the playoffs start, you know, I mean, the team that gets hot and and starts to play, you know, with some some mojo or moxie or whatever, um, a lot of times can go a long way. And and I, I I can see this team doing that, but I don't I don't see them being like, I don't see them being a top contender, but I do see them. I, I, I think they're, they're super safe for the playoffs, especially in this division. Right. And I, I kind of like what they're doing right now in lieu of being able to chase, you know, big name free agents. This is one of those years where the Sharks give the kids a chance. And it happened yeah. a couple of years ago with guys like LeBanc and Timo Meyer yeah. uh, and Thomas Hurdle. Yeah, look how now that those, turned out. Yeah, right? look yeah. how that turned out. Yeah. Now those guys are all established top sixers. This season, it's Sasha Chemilevsky, Dylan Gambrell, Ivan Shekovich, you know, Alexander True. There's like half a dozen more guys that are bubbling up all around the same time. And, you know, it's kind of an open competition for slots. And, again, I just feel like having that internal competition can help a franchise so much where spots have to be earned and you have to hang on to your slot because there's going to be somebody coming up from the AHL Barracuda 
that is ready to go and, and make their name heard with the big club at any moment. So if even a couple of these guys turn out to be regulars who can contribute in a top six role eventually, then you're still in good shape. And it also feels like getting a lot of new blood will kind of be good for this team. Yeah. You're going to have great leadership with Thornton and Brent Burns still, even though Pavelski's gone. Logan Couture is a fantastic two-way guy. And I would say, you know, he's a leader as well. Well, he's the captain. He better yeah, be. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, he's the yeah. captain of the team. So, obviously, you're getting character there. Yeah. Maybe they don't put up a ton of points in the regular season because they're learning lessons, they're figuring each other out. But I would say that this is setting the table for what could be a very good season next year and will still be a pretty good one this year. I think too when you like down the middle, you got to be good. You got to be really good down the middle. And mm -hmm. they're you know assuming that uh, Martin Jones can rebound from his pretty bad season last we'll year. We'll get to that. They, they are they yeah. are pretty good down the middle. I mean you've got. Hurdle, Couture, and, and Thornton as your center, as your top three centermen. Yeah. And then, you know, that defense we've already talked about. And then Martin Jones, if he can if he can play, you know, if he can sort of get back to where he was before last season, then you've got your you've got a, you've got something going on at least. I still I'm very worried about the depth chart on the right side though. So it's one thing to talk about competition for spots. But to me, that's fine when the competition is for the third line or the fourth line. But right now, like Kevin LeBanc projected first line right winger, and then it's a cliff. And I mean, mm. there are guys like Chmielewski mm. and or Alexander True, depending on what the final roster is going to look like, because it's been very much in flux. Sharks have been calling guys up and down. Yeah, but if you look, mm. LeBanc and then our projected depth chart in our magazine goes Chmielewski, Carlson, Barkley, Goodrow, Johnny Brodzinski. Hey! <laughs> don't think that cuts it on an yeah. NHL roster. Yeah at right wing. I think that's very dangerous looking if you're a team with playoff aspirations. It's putting a lot of pressure on a guy like Chmielewski to be a top six forward right away if he makes the team. So I don't know. I'm a bit worried. If you look at even the Sharks core, they're starting to get pretty old. We know how old Joe Thornton is, but even though Couture has crossed the 30 line, so is Mark Edward Vlasic and Brent Burns. And I know last year I brought that up to Joe Pavelski and he was like, yeah, yeah, you remember when you guys wrote us off and said we were too old two years ago when he made the Stanley Cup final? I was like, <laughs> oh yeah, but now Joe Pavelski's gone. Right. So yeah. they're older in their, in their most important positions. They're lacking for some depth. So I don't know, I'm a bit worried. Um, speaking of worried, let's get to Martin Jones. So I want to give you some Martin Jones numbers and maybe just grab your barf bags if you're ready, okay? Um, goals saved above average, a very important advanced statistic that sort of combines a bunch of stats and tells you how many goals a goalie saves compared to the average goalie in right. the NHL. Dead last, 56 goalies, the sample, okay? Goalies with a thousand or more minutes of five on five. 56th out of 56th, Martin Jones. And if you look at the stat expected goals, which is basically his workload, the quality of shots he faced it, he's 13th. So he was projected based on the quality of chances he was facing and number of chances to be the 13th best goalie in the league. And he still finished dead last. Wow. That just gives you perspective of how bad he was. He was remarkably bad, bad last season. And people talked about his playoffs. He had one really good game where he stopped you know, 59 shots or whatever it was that puffed up his stats a little bit. But I still think a lot of the Sharks' success in the playoffs was in spite of Jones not because of Jones. Uh, to me, the only thing saving Jones from losing his job at the moment is that Aaron Dell was just as bad yeah. last year. So he still has that job security. I'm personally skeptical that Jones is going to be able to bounce back. But do you guys agree or disagree? For me, I, I tend to be an optimist. And I, I think with this team, he only needs to be serviceable. And I know that the guys in that room believe in Martin Jones. And, I mean, the statistics... You can't argue with them. They they're they they're just math. They're just math, and math, <laughs> math don't care. Um, but I know that the Sharks, they think that Martin Jones is their guy. And I think that's, you know, that's key right now that he has their confidence. So he has that going for them. And you hope that, you know, for his sake and for, for San Jose's sake, that he can just be what they need a decent goaltender. He doesn't have to be stealing games for them. Uh, you just hope he doesn't let them down. And I think he he has that opportunity, and it'll be interesting to see if he can cash in on it. Yeah, and I, I mean, the thing that you worry about with a guy like that is is obviously the volume that he's allowing, but those killer goals, you know, mm -hmm. those back-breaking 
horse bleep goals that should have been stopped and, and don't get stopped. And I, I think that the one thing about the San Jose Sharks is is they're not they've got enough leadership on that team to know that like I mean if you put him behind a lot of other teams it would be like we're done you know right. we're done you look at your goalie we're done they they don't I mean they've got they've got a lot of character they've got a lot of guys who have been through that been through a lot done a lot so they can overcome those those bad goals they can overcome those games when he's leaky and still sort of be pretty good um, but I mean I just think of what they did last year when he played the way he did. Um, and, it, like, he can't be worse, can he? Right. He can't be worse. Yeah. Um, he's got to be better. He's got to be better this right. year. I, I got to think he's, he's going to be better because it's, it's, as you said, Matt, it's really difficult. It would be really difficult for him to be worse than right. he was last and, year. And he has earned the benefit of the doubt, so I should, I should give him some credit there because he's being a workhorse. He's the only goalie in the entire league to have started 60-plus games the last four seasons, each of the past four seasons. Wow. Martin Jones, the only guy. Uh, so he does deserve a mulligan, I think. Um, let's talk Kevin LeBanc, the I now ironically named That's Kevin true. LeBanc, the guy who's making almost no cheddar. Kevin yeah. LeBanc, he took that one of the most team-friendly deals we've ever seen coming off a 56-point season. And he's betting on himself to get a big raise when he's eligible to sign an extension January 1st. Mm -hmm. Can somebody kind of fill me in on what's going on with Kevin LeBanc? Is he making a smart business move or is he a little bit cuckoo? What's going on here? Well, if he's betting on himself, he's, he's, it, 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 could, it could cash in. I mean, particularly with what you mentioned. I mean, there are no other right wingers. So right. He's, he's probably going to be playing with what? Thomas Hurdle and yeah. and, Meyer and, and Timo Meyer on the other side, like that's he, he's going to get his chance. He's, he's going to get his he's going to get his chance pools. for points. He's going to get his chance yeah. for points. Um, so if he is betting on himself, then he's he's probably going to he's probably going to cash in. Yeah, and I think it's you know you read between the lines, and he did them a huge favor. Mm -hmm. It allowed them to get Joe Thornton back in the fold for at least one more season, and you know that's obviously big for the the dressing room. I, you know, I look at LeBanc and I look at the contract that Kyle Connor just signed in Winnipeg. And if LeBanc has an even better offensive season this year, you know, if he can hit 65, 70 points, then is his next contract like a seven by seven? Well, and you got to think that when he was negotiating this contract, it was like Doug Wilson was like, yeah, Kevin, like everybody's going to be laughing at you this year, but we'll take care of you. Mm. Like, I got to think that there's got, there's something yeah. there where it's like, yeah, we know, we know what yeah. we're getting. We know we are ripping you off big time. Yeah. We'll make it up in the next one, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I feel that long-term big money, Kevin LeBanc deserves it. You know, he, re he, he was a team player on this one. Big time. So next up at fourth in the Pacific, we have one of the more confounding teams of the past five years or so, the team that always on paper, oh, this is the year. They this finally, they've got all yep. those critical <laughs> upgrades. This is it. All in. The Arizona Coyotes, and they always seem to disappoint. A couple years ago, they were historically bad out of the gate, improved a lot as they got used to Coach Rick Tockett. Last year, they were in the hunt pretty close to the stretch run. Um, and now they've added, of course, Phil Kessel, big name addition to play in the top six. Uh, and, and do you guys think that this is going to be, you know, a place where Phil Kessel thrives because there's less pressure and he can kind of relax? Or do you think, is Phil Kessel kind of going to fade into obscurity now that he's not surrounded by those Penguins teammates? Because Kessel was regularly at the top of the leaderboard in power play points. So I, I'm trying to decide which factor is going to be more influential. Well, it's mm. interesting because you look on it, at it on one hand, any time that Phil Kessel's been asked to be the guy, he hasn't been able to do it, right? But he's always been asked to be the guy in a in a market that's like he's never played in a market that's not super engaged. Mm -hmm. You know, Boston, Toronto, and then Pittsburgh. Yeah. So now he's now he's in a market where he can be himself. He can be relaxed. Um, I, I think he's I think he's gonna I think he's gonna be great. I think he's gonna be really really good. Um, there was a point early in the season last year because I was down in Arizona. It was about ten or twelve games into the year that their penalty killing unit had a better had was had a better scoring percentage than their power play. 
Right. Wow. Like they like they they were more dangerous on the penalty kill than they were on the power play. Yeah. It was incredible. They just started punching guys in the face. <laughs> and so so I think I think that's going to change. Um, and, and I think I think free of the shackles of expectation, I, I think Phil Kessel will be a very very effective player. Yeah, and I think it helps that he has a relationship with Coach Rick Tockett yeah. already. Yeah. Right. So they're going to be on the same wavelength. You know, Tockett will know how he can push Kessel when he needs to sort of back off. And, you know, I mean, Phil Kessel is not a great defensive player. He's a great offensive player. And he doesn't have to be the guy necessarily in Arizona because they do have some options. And I think Clayton Keller will really help this, where it gives them a a little bit of a matchup problem for opponents where you can't just zero in on one guy. You know, Clayton Keller had the great rookie season and then really dropped off as a sophomore. I'm sure part of that had to do with the attention that he was getting once people knew what he could do at the NHL level. So now you have Kessel, you know what he can do, you still got to figure out how to stop him, but then you also have to game plan for Clayton Keller. And to me what's also interesting is how much Barrett Hayton, the rookie center, ends up playing in Arizona. He's made the team now. Yeah, he can still be sent back to junior in the Sault Ste. Marie Greyhounds, but for now, I mean, he's the center with the most upside in that organization. You know, I mean, they have some decent guys, but like Nick Schmaltz, Derek Stepan, Carl Soderberg, like none of those are number one guys. Mm -hmm. At best, they're number two guys. Barrett Hayton has the potential to be a number one guy. I wouldn't expect him to do it right now as a teenager, but at least we're going to see a little bit of that potential, and it'll be fun to see, you know, if he can get chemistry with either Kessel or Keller, what that does to this team. And Ken, I agree with the power play. You put Kessel there, you got a smart guy like Keller, you got Oliver Ekman Larson on the point. Yeah, yeah. There's the makings of something there. I'm going to call an audible on the next question. I'm looking at it, you know, we, it's about Rick Tockett. We know Rick Tockett has a, a really good relationship with these players. Rick Tockett, he's good. Uh, I want to talk <laughs> about. Clayton Keller and Nick Schmaltz, two guys that uh, received long-term contracts that involved a lot of projection. They're being Mm -hmm. paid not for what they've done, but for what they're going to do. Whereas look at Kyle Connor getting $7 million a year. He's a two-time 30-goal man. He's getting paid for what he's done. Right. Uh, But Keller's deal, and then especially Nick Schmaltz's deal, I I believe it was signed after he blew his ACL, if I remember correctly. Uh, So what my sort of big picture question is, do we know that sort of like, do we know that Phil Kessel doesn't have to be the man? Because him not being the man implies that Arizona already has someone else to fill that role. But I don't know necessarily that that's been proven yet, especially by Keller. He's the guy who's supposed to be the franchise forward. So where do you guys stand on that? Do you think Arizona has the pieces right now to become a contender, especially with those forwards? No, no. No, not yet. No. Definitely not. And you make a very good point about Keller. I think I think a successful season for the Arizona Coyotes is we're playing games that matter in February and March. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's a, that's going to be a that's going to be a that's going to be a win for the home. But team. they were last. That's what they did yeah, last year. So yeah, theoretically, yeah. you'd think they'd want to take a step yeah. forward. Yeah, yeah, because they were what they finished four points out. They were yeah they were yeah. in the mix. Yeah, yeah they yeah. were in the mix. Yeah. It feels like they need to make the playoffs because it's been a while, and you want this new. John Chaka era to have some positivity around it. it. It's it is tough to see because of the strength of the Central Division yeah. and the crossover wild card. But that's where I, I think you hope that Keller just had a sophomore jinx, yeah, and that he'll come back and he can be a guy that gives you like fifty assists. You know, maybe he hits 25 goals. He was excellent as a rookie. He was outstanding. Right. He really and was. Tr- and the year yeah. before that, he was our number one prospect in the Hockey News yeah. Future Watch. So and I don't yeah. want to jump ship on him too quickly. I'm still a believer. But he's more just fascinating to me because he's someone that sort of seems to be pre-anointed, a franchise player, and that's mm-hmm. what the money said. So now it's one thing to be given a big contract and you've already delivered on those expectations, but to be given one saying, okay, we need you to uh, perform to this amount of money. Can you score like this many million dollars, please? When he hasn't done it, that's a little bit. Yeah, but that doesn't, it doesn't kick in until next year, so he doesn't have to score that many uh, millions of dollars, yeah. right? That's you know, he's, he's still on his entry level deal this year. So, yeah. and, and I think, you know, I think they did that because they looked at what happened this summer with all the RFAs and they were like, no thanks. No thanks. <laughs> we, don't, we don't really want to be in that position right. with our guy. Um, so, it, you, know, you know, and we've got the space, so let's, let's go with it here. I, I think, 
I think Clayton Keller is is going to be an outstanding player. I think he's mm -hmm. going to be a terrific player. And this could be um, Nathan McKinnon, right? When when McKinnon signed yeah. his contract in 2016, mm -hmm. he arguably was not producing at the level of a six plus million dollar player. Yeah, he's, he had been a bit of a disappointment, right? Especially factoring right. in inflation, that was six million a few years ago was more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Colorado projected, okay, we're going to give you more than what you're doing and hope that it becomes a bargain in a few years. And now it's like people every day are just losing it on Twitter. Oh my God. <laughs> and that, you never know, maybe that happens to Clayton Keller in a few mm -hmm. years where he's mm -hmm. a 90 point player. And, but the upside is certainly there. It certainly is. And my, I guess my only worry would be the fact that Arizona has the space to pay these guys and they got them locked down at those amounts. I guess my only worry is if you get a little bit of complacency there where for those guys it's like got my big paycheck and it's it's not like something overt you know it's a subconscious thing where you feel relaxed maybe that can be a positive yeah but at the same it, time yeah. it's like hey we can give you these big contracts because we don't have anybody else to pay it's like yeah or you could have made them earn a little bit more it, you know we know you're getting to the cap floor and things like that but feels like they need to be you still got to spend your money wisely. Well, yeah. I mean, when John Chanka signed that deal with Clayton Keller, he was envisioning four years into this deal, everybody's going to be talking about how team-friendly it is. Mm -hmm. yeah, right? Exactly. And that, that, was, that, was the, that was the end game, for sure. For sure. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting, you know, last season, two, well, let's, let's flash back actually two years ago. So two years ago, Antti Ranta, one of the best goalies in the NHL. Last year, Ranta's hurt, Darcy Kemper steps in, and he's one of the best goalies in the NHL. I, I believe he finished his, uh, fifth in Vezina voting, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken. Mm -hmm. uh, and it sort of s sets up to be a bit of a crease controversy where, you know, there's talk of each guy having an equal workload. But then, of course, Antti Ranta, lower body injury, he's already on the shelf. So what's going to happen with this crease? And do you think it's, you know, the, at the end we're going to see, assuming Ranta's not badly hurt, are we going to see an even split, or does one guy emerge? This kind of feels like in Carolina last year with Peter Mrazek and Curtis McElhinney, where Mrazek was the guy nominally, but he had some injuries early. McElhinney played very well in his stead. And then you get to the stretch and Mrazek comes back. I wonder if it's something similar in Arizona. Now, the thing is, we don't know if Arizona's going to make the playoffs as Carolina did. But I have faith in Darcy Kemper. I think that he can be that guy for them for a long period of time. And with Ranta, that's almost like your bonus at this point, even though he's supposed to be the guy. When he comes back, you're sort of gifted with this really strong battery of two veterans. And if he's healthy, I think if Ranta's healthy, all things being equal, he's the guy. Mm -hmm. He's the guy. That, but the question is, I mean, he just has not been able to stay healthy. And mm -hmm. I think part of that is because, like, he's such a battler, right? Like, he never gives up on a puck. He's always, and I think, you know, that sort of, a, all that activity tends to wear him a bit. Um, but, but I think all things being equal, they're both healthy. They're both playing at, their, at the top of their games. I, I don't think, I, I think, I think Ranta's the number one guy. Yeah, I think Ranta's peak is just a little bit higher than Kemper's peak. Mm -hmm. Projected at fifth place in the Pacific, it is, to me, the most interesting team in the division this year, the team with the widest range of outcomes, the Vancouver Canucks. And, you know, you look at recent teams that have sort of risen up. In every season, it's a new team that sort of breaks through. They develop their, their critical mass of young prospects. And to me, Vancouver looks like a team that's close. you got Elias Pettersson, the Calder, Brock Besser, um, uh, second place in the Calder vote the year before, Quinn Hughes. Calder contender this year, mm -hmm. Thatcher Demko knocking on the door behind Jacob Markstrom. <clears throat> uh, so I guess that first question of our burning questions is, it's big picture. Do you think that Vancouver's rebuild is done? And is it time to start thinking of the Canucks as a team that, okay, if we miss the playoffs, that's a failure. We're playoffs or bust now. No. Well, I, <laughs> but I, I think, <laughs> I, I think that if there's going to be a team that's going to surprise people, it, it could very well be this one. Mm. I, th I think this team think could so. be one of those teams that, they're in second place in the Pacific in December, and you're like, what? You know, th this wasn't supposed to happen, but then everything sort of just falls into place. Um, will that happen? Probably not. Um, I, I think there's still a lot of work to do in Vancouver. Um, and, you know, I mean, are you rebuilding when you sign Tyler Myers and trade for Michael and sign Michael Furland and, and, uh, and all of that? I, I don't think you're really in a rebuild mode then. 
Um, so, yeah, I think th th I, I, I agree with you. This is going to be a really intriguing team to watch. I don't know how good they're going to be. I don't think they're going to be great, but they're, gonna, they're probably going to be really fun to watch. Yeah, I, I think the key word there is they could surprise, which right. means we do not expect them. Mm -hmm. I feel like they're at that part of the rebuild where fans get a little antsy, but hopefully management knows that this is just the beginning. Like, now the table is set. You've got your elements. Almost all of them have good NHL experience. And, uh, you know, like, Thatcher Demko is kind of the next, as you know, the goalie's kind of the last piece. And depth after that and just figuring things out. I think bringing in the veterans is nice for stability. Um, but, you know, you have to let these guys come along organically. Like Elias Pettersson, he's probably going to be a force this year. But what if he has a sophomore jinx? Yeah. It could happen, sure you know? Could. Sure could. Um, Brock Besser, he's got to play 82 games this year or close and to he's it. he's already in concussion protocol. Yeah. Yeah, so you, you need a full season of Brock Besser. You know, Adam Gaudet's getting a chance straight out of camp. I think that's very positive. Um, you know, on the back end, Quinn Hughes is going to start becoming a regular, and that's going to be a big step. But again, like, you don't want Quinn Hughes to be playing, like, 26 minutes a night. Like, he's a rookie. Right. You want him to be in comfortable situations where he can get his sea legs and he can use his skating to his advantage, which is what Quinn Hughes does best. I think that there's a lot of hope here in Vancouver, but for fans, I think the expectation should be you get to watch all these young kids play together for the first time or basically for the first time. If they win some games, cool. If not, that's fine. See, I think, I think that's the motto for last year. But Jim Benning sent a different message when he signed Myers and he brought in, or signed Michael Ferland, traded for JT Miller. <laughs> And, and I think now the reason why fans have justification to be antsy is, no, 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 look, those are win-now moves. Mm. And I'm not saying it means the Canucks were trying to be a Stanley Cup contender, but I think what Benning saw is, okay, the, the critical mass of the young guys is there. Now it's the right window to add the veterans to augment that group. And, you know, we can say that Tyler Myers got overpaid. He did. But Tyler Myers, compared to not Tyler Myers, is still an improvement for right. the Vancouver Canucks defense. And right. same goes for JT Miller. Same goes for Michael oh, Ferland. Yeah. So I think it's okay Joey to have... Ben. Yeah, Joey Ben. Joey <laughs> Ben, yeah. And, and it's funny, like, Benning a few years ago was still making these kinds of signings, like Louis Erickson, yeah. when the timing was wrong. Yeah. But I think now maybe it's close. Like, sure, maybe he could have waited one more year, but I think it's close enough. He's seen, you know, again, like... Calder, a Calder winner and a Calder runner-up in back-to-back -back years, I think it's close enough that it's like, okay, now let's give these kids some veteran support. And we know our division is pretty flimsy, so yeah. you never know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and let's talk about goaltending. So I just want to hear a prediction. Thatcher Demko, we know he's been the goalie of the future. I'm personally a big fan. He's, he's kind of reminded me of Connor Hellebuck throughout his development. Like He's a big guy, big wingspan, a lot of swagger, a lot of big game experience like in, at, at, at uh, younger levels as mm -hmm. well. So he comes in, I, like, to me, I, I always felt a lot of confidence that Hellebuck was going to be a star. And I, I felt that about Demko as well. But do you think he is up there to legitimately threaten and steal the job from Markstrom or not yet? I feel like this is the year that Demko plays like 30 games. Because yeah. yeah. Markstrom played pretty well yeah. last year. Like he was surprising to me. I didn't think Jacob yeah. Markstrom had that in him. Yeah, I think you have to give, I think you have to give Markstrom the... the the benefit of the doubt because of yeah. the season he had last year. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think Markstrom still gets the bulk of starts, but you make sure that Demko's in there pretty consistently because otherwise he might as well be in the AHL because you want him getting reps. Yeah. So I think having him up, he's got to be playing sort of one every three games, you know, whatever it happens to be. Um, but he's not the guy yet. And, and if this team has any designs on on making a run for the playoffs, um, he's going to have to be good in those games. Yeah, he's, he's going to have to win. He's going to have to win two or th two out of the three of those games yeah. because they're probably going to be against well teams that are <laughs> the Edmontons and the LAs and yeah. and those are the games. If if they have any designs on you know even competing for a playoff spot, they've got to they've got to win those games against the Ottawa's, against the Detroit's, against the uh, uh, the LAs, against the Edmontons, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So. Yeah. Um, so he's going to have to, he's, they're going to need him to, mm -hmm. they're going to need, not just to fill a spot for 30 games, they're going to need him to, 
to make some real progress. And I think, you know, with respect to the veterans, I mean, it's, it's more of a, now it's more of a on the fly build rather than a complete rebuild because now you're bringing in guys, you're right, Matt, that I think the big concern when you get a bunch of young guys like this is that they learn how to lose. You know, right. and, they, and they learn to accept losing a little too easily. And, but, you know, I mean, Michael Furlan's not going to let that happen. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, there's going to be guys on this roster that are not going to let that happen. Mm. Fair. Uh, to me, to me, Demko and, and Markstrom, it's a ceiling play versus a floor play. We know Markstrom is the safe guy where he's, you know, he's an NHL or he's experienced. He's a 9-10 save percentage kind of guy. He's probably not going to get better than that at, at this point in his career. But we know that he's not going to be terrible, whereas Demko, the outcome, the range of outcomes is very wild because yeah. he might be, oh, he's not ready, he chokes, or no, now he's arrived. So my prediction is sort of like, uh, okay, Vancouver makes the playoffs as the eighth seed, and then uh, Markstrom gets shelled in the first couple of games, and Demko is the starter by the end of the playoffs, and then the next year he's the he opens the season as the, the starter. Uh. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit of, of hype train, and... Let's talk Quinn Hughes. There's a lot of talk, of course, about his brother Jack. Uh, but where do you guys stand on Quinn? And do you think, are people pre-anointing Quinn? Is it sort of a Kale McCarr situation as well? Or just as we've said before with McCarr, who we all love, do we think that Quinn Hughes is ready for prime time? Oh, I, th I, th I think the body of work, the small body of work that we yeah. saw, it, it, it indicates that he is. Yeah, he's ready. He can move the puck. He can move it with his feet. He can move it with his stick. He's a smart player. Um, you know, we'll probably have to work on his defensive game. We'll probably hit the wall after about 50 games and, and we'll be a lot less effective down the stretch than, than he is in the first part of the season. But I think every, everything indicates that this, this guy is ready, uh, ready to play a full season in the NHL without question. And, and I think be one of the better rookies in the league. I think so too. I mean, he's that modern style Puck moving defenseman doesn't have a ton of size, but makes up for it with his skating. And this is where a guy like Tyler Myers comes in, where you can balance yeah. off. Mm -hmm. You know, you get a guy with great size and great reach uh, who can move fairly well for a big man, mm -hmm. and you pair him with Hughes, where there's going to be mistakes. I mean, there always is when you talk about offensive defensemen. That compounds when you're talking about a kid that's just entering the league. But if you compare him with a veteran that can hang back or at least make those reads where he knows when his partner is in trouble, then there's that nice cushion back there for Quinn Hughes where he can go out and play that swashbuckling style and the Canucks reap the rewards of that high end. I think that's sort of the best case scenario right now. And you let him make mistakes. And that's why I'm thinking this is the year that it's still part of the rebuild because you want Quinn Hughes to like make dumb turnovers occasionally so he knows what a dumb turnover is so yeah. that he does not make a dumb turvnover next year right. you lock him, when you lock him in the vi lock him in the video room with the assistant coach for yes right three hours after practice every day yeah exactly yeah. I just like picture picturing a, a Quinn Hughes Tyler Myers pairing because it's like Quinn Hughes and then two Quinn Hughes stacked together wearing a trench coat <laughs> equals <laughs> Tyler Myers right I think that'd be fun that would be Projected for sixth place in the Pacific is a team that I must admit gives me headaches. Just sorting through the drama and the firings and the falling short of expectations, the Edmonton Oilers. Uh, and we know they have tried to make some major changes, wholesale changes in the offseason. New general manager Ken Holland, new head coach Dave Tippett. And we know what Dave Tippett brings. He's a defensive minded coach. And I've said before, uh, you know, he had less talent in theory than what he has in Edmonton, you know, with, with McDavid, Drysaddle, and Nugent Hopkins uh, when he was in Arizona. And he got that team to the conference final in 2011-12. So do we believe that this defensive system under Dave Tippett is going to change the fate of the Oilers and make them good defensively? No, no, uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, you talk about how they had less talent in Arizona, but they've got top-end talent in Edmonton and but overall you had more NHL caliber players in mm. Arizona. Both teams had Without less question. Win. And the yeah, <laughs> oh and the God. and the other, the other thing is 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 you know Ken Hitchcock was one of the best defensive coaches in the history of the game. Yeah. Let's say that again just so we all remember. Ken Hitchcock was one, one of, of the best, best defensive coaches, coaches in the, the history, history of, of the, the game. game. Right? Okay. Um, the problem for the Oilers is that they don't have enough NHL players. Mm. They just don't. And when you're not an NHL player, you're not good enough to play defense in the NHL. 
right? So I, I don't see anybody being able to coach them into being able to do that. Otherwise, they would have been able to do it by now. Yeah, I just I worry about the buy-in for some of these guys. And there wasn't a lot of change over the summer. James Neal was one. I don't see him moving the needle defensively. Marcus Granlin, yes. Yeah. I think, you know, he can help as a defensive forward. But it's just it seems like it's too much of a hill to climb. And you don't want to be like a trap team unless you have different rules for McDavid and Dreisaitl because you want to unleash those guys. You want to be able to go end-to-end because nobody goes better end-to-end than Connor McDavid. He's the fastest, best skater in the NHL, and he can make plays at high speeds, and Leon Dreisaitl can complement that if they're playing together. If they're not playing together, Leon Dreisaitl can be the engine on his own line, but you want to take advantage of those guys, so you can't be dogmatic about it but then the problem is the, the rest of the roster. Exactly. And we looked at the depth chart actually was released today uh, at the time of recording this podcast, the, the lines in practice just a couple days before the season starts. And you had guys like Thomas Yurko getting a shot on the top line, projected top line, guy with no points last year. And on the right side of that projected top line is James Neal. James, the real deal Neal, had 10 straight 20 goal seasons. And then last year he just tanked in Calgary. Uh, he's certainly going to get an opportunity. You know, who knows if he's going to stick with McDavid, but he'll get power play looks. Do you believe that James Neal is going to have a career revival this year in Edmonton? Well, I think he's he's going to be better by virtue of the fact that, I mean, he's going to be playing with the best player in the world. Yeah. And I, I mean, there there he'll he'll get a bunch of goals just by accident. You would think, right? Yeah. Um, he's going to get more ice time, more quality ice time with better players. So you would think that if, if he can't come back, then, then he really is done. Um, he may be done anyways, but um, I, I would just, I, you know, I mean, who, who else is going to play power play? Who else is going to get points on this team? I am. I'm actually, really? they just called me, and uh, between, yeah. between when I'm going to do the game story, but I'm going to play in the game. Right. Really? I'm going to get like four yeah. minutes a night, and nice. then I'm going to write nice. a story about how bad I was. Okay. There you go, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I could see James Neal getting 20 goals and 20, 25 assists, but say he's playing with McDavid. McDavid getting points and goals was not the problem. It's when McDavid's not on the ice right. that you have the problem. So, again, like is James Neal doing enough to make a difference to get this team into the playoffs? I don't know. I think it's, it's more like what you're getting from lines two through four. And, again, if, if Dreisaitl's playing on his own line, that's a start, but do you have enough talent to play with Leon Dreisaitl and to keep up with Leon Dreisaitl? It's tough to say, and I mean, they didn't do anything with their defense core other than they might get a little bit younger, but I don't know. I I just don't know where you go from here at this point unless you make some kind of major trade. Yeah, I I think even though, yes, I think James Neal has more upside in his stick as a goal scorer than than Milan Lucic had, Mm. but the roster itself, the forward group is stretched thinner than Saran Wrap. And I know it's hard to hear for Oilers fans, and I've said before, like this year, every year there's a fan base that hates me. This year the Oilers fans really hate me, but it's not personal Oilers fans. If you're out there watching or listening, it's just, look at that depth chart. Your team sucks. It's just, it's real bad. <laughs> the best off-season additions, and, and Leon Dreisaitl said, said this in a scrum at BioSteel, he said, oh, our depth additions were good. That's never a good sign if you're singling out the depth as the best additions. Marcus Granlin, James Neal, your team missed the playoffs by 11 points. That's not going to be enough. Mm. Uh, and I think goaltending, that's our next segment here, is going to be a problem too. Miko Koskinen, the guy who got the huge contract from Peter Shirelli as a final just bullet fired before, like days before, hours <laughs> before he got fired. They forgot to change the password on the game. I guess so. Uh, and Guessed. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and I did the math last year unofficially. He got the most money for the smallest sample size by, for any goalie in the cap era. Uh, at the time, it was like 27 games of NHL experience, and now he's earning more than $4 million a year. Shout out to Miko Koskinen's agent. Yeah, that's right. And Mike, Mike Smith is brought in to push him. So how do you see this crease playing out this year? Poorly? <laughs> <laughs> Not well? <laughs> I mean, maybe Mike Smith can be serviceable. I mean, he, he, had, he had times in Calgary. He had times when he was he good. He had times? He had times. Yeah, yeah. There were times. There yeah. were instances. Yeah. So maybe he's got a little... I mean, this is sort of the last kick at the can for a goalie who's in his late 30s. 
So maybe you see that sort of like last stand for Mike Smith. But Mikos Koskinen, I just feel like he's probably a KHL goaltender. And again, I, I, I say, I've said this a couple of times in these previews that once NHL shooters get a book on a guy, you're done. So any success Koskinen had early, was it because he was good or was it because NHLers didn't know who he was? Watch for guys to go glove high on him. And there's the book. Yeah. There's the book. Ken Campbell, <laughs> he started playing beer league last year. And I now started playing beer Ken, league two years ago oh, again. Wow. Again, after wow. coaching my son for many, many okay. years. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'm glad that's <laughs> former <laughs> Sudbury Wolves tryout participant. Participant. Ken Campbell. Yep. Big on the participant. Over, right. overager. But uh, yeah, no, but uh, I mean, I just look at this whole. This whole situation in Edmonton, and just don't you just feel like depressed? Yes, and I said that, and <laughs> I got roasted for it. But it was just <laughs> I, like the the scrum that Drysaddle gave in the summer. The, it wasn't Drysaddle being depressed, and that was misconstrued. It was just that the questions. It was like, wow, this feels like February, and once again, a guy being grilled. But these questions that clearly the answer is like our team's not good. Well, it's at the it's a downer at the preseason uh, NHL tour. Uh, they brought a guy from each team, and Ryan Nugent Hopkins was the guy from the Oilers. And it, it was a lot of the same thing. They were like, well, you know, were you really disappointed about last year? And he said, no, I think the year before we were even more disappointed. And, you know, it was like, <laughs> and, and it was like, well, you know, how do you, you know, do you, do you think there's going to be a challenge adjusting to a new coach and a new GM? And he looks and he's like, no, this is like the seventh coach I've had. Uh, <laughs> you know, <yeah>. so. <laughs> I just hope they keep Dave Tippett for like, four years at least. Just like have some semblance of continuity. Yeah. yeah. So next up, we're getting to the, the basement. And this is a team that, you know, I think they have some upside, but when they bought out Corey Perry, the Anaheim Ducks, they sent the message. They understand that they're willing to get younger and maybe go backwards to get better. Uh, and let's start with, you know, the forward group because we know Corey Perry's gone. Ryan Kessler is not going to play this year. Patrick Eves is not going to play this year. Uh, both guys, their careers might be over. So the keys are being handed to the kids. Guys like Sam Steele, Troy Terry, they're going to get their shot this year. Uh, and do you guys think we're going to see a surprisingly NHL-ready effort from this group, or do they need more seasoning? Mm. I think they'll be NHL-ready, but I don't think they have the offensive upside as a group to help the Ducks surprise, per se. You know, you look at, like, Maxime Comtois. I think he's going to be an excellent two-way player in the NHL. Maybe he never gets more than, say, 60, 65 points, but that's okay because he's doing a whole bunch of other stuff on the ice. With Sam Steele and Troy Terry, there's more offensive upside there, but I think it's going to be a long process because they're not going to have a lot of guys around to take the focus off. I mean, other than Ryan Getzlaff. Who knows what Getzlaff has left in the tank? He's been around for a long time. But he's also played some excellent hockey of late, so you can't count him out yet either. What I see is a team that is in the midst of a rebuild. I think that you know getting Trevor Zegers in the first round this year was a huge building block. We're not going to see him right away because he's going the NCAA route, but that's fine. But this is a team where they need a couple of more high-end picks before yeah. we really consider them ready for that sort of Vancouver phase, if you will. Right, right. And, and I mean, they, they should get another one of those this year. Yes. You would think. Um, you know, I, I, don't think, I don't think success in Anaheim is going to be measured by wins and losses this year. Yeah, it's going to no. be measured by how those three players in particular, what kind of development curve they have this mm. year and whether or not they show that they're ready, they're ready to, to, to take on a, a more sort of significant role. Because, I mean, you know, I mean, Ryan Gatzlaff is up there. There's somebody's going to have to take that torch at some point, right? Um, so I think that's that's how you measure success this year. Is is do the kids are the kids engaged? Are they giving us a chance? Are they are they making us fun to watch? Are they you know are they doing playing the right way, doing the right things, living the right way, um, you know, doing things the right way, going to the weight room after practice like they're supposed to? You know, that's how you you would measure this season if you're Anaheim. Yes, and and I think furthering that message is the fact that they promoted Dallas Eakins to head coach. So Eakins mm -hmm. is a guy who's already coached 
Sam Steele, guys like that. Right? He's yeah. already coached, uh, not Comtois, but I think he's coached Max Jones, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and Troy at, Terry. At, and, and Troy, yeah, Terry, and Troy yeah. Terry at the San Diego level. And we know that he's a coach that's already worked with these young kids. And to me, when you're bringing in like a, a youth-oriented coach, a developmental coach in a way, it's sending the message, you're going to be allowed to make mistakes this year, even if it costs us wins. It's kind of like what we were saying yeah. about Quinn Hughes before. And uh, so I agree. It's going to be a year of just progress and being allowed to fail, which I think is super important. Uh, Ryan Getzlaff is an interesting case because uh, to me it's like the minute, like Getzlaff and Corey Perry have always been compared to each other, their career trajectories, they were drafted in the same round the same year, they got matching contracts the same year uh, when they were extended, same length of time, and now Perry's gone, bought out. We know Getzlaff's career has aged better than Perry's as a big playmaker guy, he's been healthier, uh, but I feel like you still have to at least start thinking about Getzlaff's future the minute you see Perry gone, it's like... Is Getzlaff going to be a Joe Thornton type who stays years and years and years with this team? Or, knowing that he's only got a couple years left on his deal, does Getzlaff start to become trade bait before he's, his career, before he gets so far along that he's not really a useful piece to a contender? Yeah, well, I mean, he's been good the last couple of years without Corey Perry. Mm -hmm. Effectively without Corey yeah, Perry. Yeah, that's right. So I don't think there's any concern in terms of whether or not he is going to be, he's going to show up. You know, I mean, he's showed up the last couple of years for this team when it hasn't been very good and there hasn't been a whole lot of hope or a whole lot of reason for optimism around him. Um, he's a pro. He's a pro. Like, he's, a, he's an ultimate pro. He's one of these guys, I think, that as he gets older in his career, he's going to be one of those elder statesman guys oh, that, sure. that, you know, everybody in the league respects and, and looks up to, like, you know, like... Um, you know, like not on this, like a Justin Williams type of guy, yep, you know, the sure. guy that everybody sort of goes, oh, yeah, Ryan gets left. He's he's the standard by which we measure. And so I, I would think that even if the game part drops off, which it will at some point, there's still going to be a lot of currency for him in his ability to be able to say to these young kids, OK, this is how you be a pro. This is how you do it. The, you know, this is how you practice. This is how you live. This is how you eat. This is how you... You know, this is how you approach games. This is what you do on days off. You know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I think Ryan Getzlaff plays his entire career yeah. in Anaheim. I think his jersey gets retired basically mm -hmm. as soon as they can. I think if he wants a job with the front office or coaching once he does retire, it's definitely there. And I think the next couple of years while he's still under contract, you see that transition. I mean, he's a big dude. That's not going to change. That's very helpful. Um, I think the Joe Thornton analogy is pretty good. The luxury Anaheim has is that he's already under contract. You don't have to worry every year about doing one-year deals with Ryan Getzlaff because he's already long-term under contract. I think they let him play out that string. And yeah, he continues to be a great leader. He helps the young kids, the next generation of Ducks. And he retires as one of the franchise's legends. Kids, keep in mind, he's got his cup ring. Mm -hmm. yeah. He doesn't have anything to chase. He doesn't have to go to a Olympics. contender. He's got the Olympics. He's got, yeah, he's got everything. He's got it all. But he won it so young in his career. It's he, true. You know, he was just, just a baby when he got that cup. Yeah. And he wasn't, you know, he, he was a, a big part of that team, but he wasn't, you know, that was a Team Mussolini team. Right. Yeah. J.S. Jaguar team and Niedermeyer team. Those are the, the pillars Pronger on that team. team. Yeah. And Chris Pronger team. Mm -hmm. So w the only scenario I could see happening is, you know, Getzlaff gets this year where he, he indoctrinates the kids with all his teachings. But... If Getzlav wanted one more push when he's getting to the end the of his Ray contract, thing. yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. because it's been so long. It's but yeah. Bork had never won. Bork had never won. Right. But it's right. been so long that if you're a Getzlav, maybe you want one more shot at it, and then you can always come back, right? So I think there could be a mutually beneficial situation where you you rent out Getzlav, yeah. you, you net a pick, and then he comes back for right. another year later. Right. Mm -hmm. And this right. is down the road, not not probably yeah, not this and year. And I think too, and in, in the absence of him falling off. I think you have to give him the benefit of the doubt that he's still going to be really good. Yeah. Because because of all those things we talked about. He's he's not going to let himself you know, he's not going to go down without he's not he's no, not going to go down yeah. looking. He's going to go healthy. down swinging. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. more yeah, yeah. about his yeah. body, right? Right. It's, it's, yeah. right. it's not right. for forget stuff, it's not the skill, it's just whether his body can hold up. Yeah. Uh, and an interesting thing about the Ducks blue line is just a few years ago we were talking about the Ducks in the same breath as Nashville and Carolina the best blue lines in the league, but since then, they've in consecutive years, they've traded Sammy Vatanen and Brandon Montour, and now it's like that blue line's starting to look a little bit thin. You still have mm -hmm. Hampus Lindholm, you still have Josh Manson, but it's not what it was. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you guys think that this blue line, is it still a strength? Is it a weakness, or is that going too far? 
it feels like it's kind of neutral at this point because you still have Hampus Lindholm and Josh Manson who are underrated. I, I think that you know Brendan Goulet looked pretty good in the preseason. I think that was that was nice for them. Yeah, he's been doing that for a lot of years. I suppose he's, so, but now it, it's an it, that's, that's one of those ones where it's like, yeah, he's, he's every year he, since yeah, yeah. he's going to make the team, or it's it's he's close, he's close, he's close. Well, okay, maybe now. I I just feel like there's not enough texture to this blue line, you know, like there's not. You know, I mean, Cam Fowler's a good offensive defenseman, yeah. but, you know, there's limitations there as well. Like, I, I just feel like it, it's not, a, it's not a, a defense that you look at and you go, that, that I don't think it strikes a fear into They're not really anybody. Other than yeah. Manson. Manson's yeah, yeah. hard to play. I mean, yeah. Lindholm's hard to play against in a new school way. Yeah, yeah. But I know what you're saying. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's a tough one. I, 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 I agree. I think they're, they're a league average group, at least. They're going to they're move the puck well. And they're going to yeah. move the puck well mm -hmm. to a group of forwards that's going to be fast. A lot faster than last year's group, I think, overall, if you look at the sum of the parts. Right. But overall, I think, yeah, I think it's, it's neutral. And the hope is just that there's enough support for John Gibson, who I still think might be the best goaltender in the world in terms of just his actual raw skill level and ability. Uh, and it's just a matter of... the. the difficulty of his workload has just skyrocketed in recent years mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. problem is with this group of young forwards especially like I don't know if that's going to get better that might get worse there might it be might, even more pucks might. flying at John Gibson this yeah. year so particularly if you take the attitude yeah we're, we're not we're going to let you guys freelance we're going to let you do what you do best right and live with the mistakes yeah uh, to a point right to you point. have to pat John Gibson on the back and be like Sorry, buddy. It's going to be a long it's year, but we promise fault. next year we're going to help. It's not your yeah. fault. <laughs> exactly. It's exactly. not your fault. So projected for last place in the Pacific Division, we have the LA Kings, a team that's had quite a fall from grace from the two cups in 2012 and 2014. Uh, for my money, one of the, the least talent-rich teams in the NHL right now. And I, I said, it, <laughs> yeah. Least talent. That's a, that's a good They're euphemism. talent poor. They're a le the least, least talent, talent rich, rich team in the I league. I can just say talent yeah, poor. Yeah, yeah. Talent uh, poor. But I'm when, one of the least money rich people yes, I know. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> least talented. Uh, but this is a team that I actually have, remember a few podcasts ago, I said that Ottawa would finish 29th and beat two teams in the standings. And one of them was Detroit. The other one, I think, is LA. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And it's interesting because what do you do if you're Drew Doughty? You've signed this long-term extension, which you brokered yourself. Woo, no agent. And now it looks like the majority of that extension is going to be played on some bad teams because to me the Kings look like one of the teams furthest from the Stanley Cup. They're, they're mm. starting to pile up prospects, but I still think they need a lot more. So what do you do if you're Drew Doughty? Does he, is he just stuck? Does he, do you request a trade? Do you just hope that the team's going to improve over the course of your deal or what? Nah. Uh, I you mean, live in California, baby. Yeah, yeah. You got multiple enjoy Stanley it. Cups. Enjoy yeah, your time. Yeah. Olympic on, gold medal. Enjoy North your trophy. time on Manhattan yeah. Beach. Just hope yeah. the NHL goes back to the Olympics so you can play some really good hockey in yeah. a couple of years. You see where the make world your eight, Make your 8 million bucks for the next 11 years. Each of the 11, next 11 years. 11 million yeah. for 8 years. Or sorry, 11 yeah, million yeah. for the next 8 years. Mm. And so, yeah. And, and you, try to, you try to still be in the conversation as one of the best defensemen in the league. Yeah, you see where the world championship is being hosted every summer, and you say yay or nay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Steven, like, producer Poland, Steven no. fist pumped the yeah. world championship. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 maybe. Okay. Austria, yeah, that might be good. Yeah, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Zurich, okay, I've never been there. Mm. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, it's, I, it's a tough situation for him because the contract just kicks in, uh, and the yeah. Kings are flatlining. Maybe this is just a new Drew Doughty where in the future – his job is to be that leader where he can teach young blue liners what to do. Now, the problem is Drew Doughty is such a natural freak of a player that he doesn't necessarily abide by the typical rules of right. you need to be in the gym yes. yeah, crushing yeah, it all yeah, the time. Because yeah. you know, Drew Doughty's just naturally yeah. good at everything. John John Stevens, Let's go out and get into yeah. a bar fight. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's what John Stevens used to have to tell Drew Doughty. Yeah. He used to be like, everyone tries to follow you, but they can't follow you doing your not exercising thing. Yeah. Pretend so can you're you please mortal, just Drew. do some stuff and then <laughs> yeah. they'll fall. He's like, oh, okay, yeah. good idea. Don't do what Drew Doughty does. doesn't do. Yeah. 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 That's right. But, I mean, you know, maybe he can say, Here, here's what I've been told of other veterans do. Yeah. Eat nutritiously and train and, all the time. And be really talented. And be really talented. Yeah. Be, be, really, be, be super talented. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like Wayne Gretzky coaching. <laughs> Why are you guys in here? <laughs> That's right. Uh, another pillar uh, of the Stanley Cup team, still with the organization, and signed for a lot of money, long-term as well, 
is Andre Kopitar. And Kopitar's career lately has been just a roller coaster. And, you know, two years ago, he's an MVP candidate. He's a Selkie Trophy winner. He's got, he, he has more than 90 points. And last year, his game just tanks. What's going on with Kopitar? And are we seeing a guy age out of his best years now because he's mm -hmm. a big guy? Yep. Or is the pendulum going to swing back the other way? It's hard, though. Like, when, yeah. you're, when you're that kind of guy logging those kinds of minutes against the kind of players that he has to, against whom he has to play, right? Like, he's going up against all the You have to chase Connor McDavid around. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And, and so that, that's got to be, that's got to be tough. I, I, he also was in Chicago for the um, preseason tour, and it was, you could tell, he, he was like, what I did last year was unacceptable. Mm -hmm. and, and so the spirit is willing. The spirit is willing. There's no question about it. Is the body able? That's the other question. And I'm not 100% sure it is. Well, and even though the Pacific isn't a great division, I, I mean, you're right. It's not only chasing McDavid, it's chasing Elias Pettersson. It's maybe trying to keep yeah. tabs Logan on Johnny Gaudreau. Logan yeah. Gaudreau. Yeah, like, Tom, well, Thomas Hurdle, too, yeah, right? Like, yeah. if you're going head-to-head -head with the best centers in that division, like, it's tough. Like, everybody on Vegas is fast. You know, yeah. how do you yeah. game plan for that? I mean, Kopitar is a smart guy, and he's a big guy, so that helps. But, I mean, in the open ice, I think that's that's a big concern for Los Angeles. He's going to need help. Right, and I think he's a guy who, just as on the other side of the coin, a guy like Johnny Gaudreau explodes when the slash and crackdown happens, you, you wonder now if the game, as the game is opening up, a bigger, slower guy like Kopitar might be someone who's hurt by the changes in the game. I also think just the line mate quality Mm -hmm. For Kopitar is a problem. The Kings just, they don't have a lot of talent until yeah. their younger guys like Gabe Velarde, guys like that, are ready uh, to make the NHL, assuming they do. Uh, you know, it's Dustin Brown has had a nice resurgence in recent years, but yeah. again, mm -hmm. there's a ceiling there that's not very high. And, you know, when you have guys like Alex Iafallo being thrown onto the top line, that really, no disrespect to Alex Iafallo, but that, on a good team, he might be a third or fourth liner. And that, yeah. that says yeah. a lot about yeah. the state yeah. of the Kings forward group. And I know they're taking a, a, a chance on Pro Horkin. Who knows what's going to happen with him? Miners. Uh, yeah, mine, like <laughs> it's, maybe he's going to get a shot eventually, but I don't know. Like it already is, seems to already be falling short of expectations. So I think Kopitar, just offensively, you might not see the numbers bounce back because who's finishing the chances that he's setting up? Yeah. And then we have Jonathan Quick. It, it's, I feel bad, you know, this is getting depressing, but again, this is the eighth place team, so it's not yeah, going to yeah. be puppies and rainbows. Don't worry, it's just the worst team yeah, in the conference. Yeah, it's the worst team in the conference, maybe, maybe the worst team in the NHL. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan Quick, where do we stand? And do you think this is the year that Quick has to start, you know, it was, you have guys like Jack Campbell and Cal Peterson getting chances more because of injury problems, but now it's like, should they be getting chances on merit? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, and the thing that worries you about it is that, is that, he really struggled last year, Jonathan Quick, and you could say it's because of the team. But I mean, both Campbell and Peterson were <laughs> were really good behind yeah. the same team. Yeah. Um, so that you know that indicates to me that I mean it's a lot easier to come in and be good in those situations mm -hmm. when the games mean nothing and when you know you're not the guy that's being counted on. Uh, I think I think that that has to be taken into account. But you know. I mean, part of the reason why the LA Kings struggled so much last year was because Quick wasn't very good. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you look at a guy, we talked about Marc-Andre Fleury, a guy like Quick who's very athletic, moves around the crease a lot, up and down all the time. He's, you know, he's got that, his signature move for me is like, he's looking down here through everybody's <laughs> legs and yeah. everything like that. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a concern. That's yeah. definitely a concern. Yeah, and if you look at Campbell and Cal Peterson, they both have pretty intriguing origin stories. Jack Campbell, highly touted mm. goaltending prospect, 11th overall from Dallas, looked like a bust for a couple of years. And then, sure enough, last year in Los Angeles, he really seemed to find his game. Cal Peterson, a player that was drafted by Buffalo, went to Notre Dame, decided not to sign with the Sabres, thought LA was a better shot. And it's kind of funny, because it's like, at the time, it's like, wait, you think you had a better shot with Jonathan Quick's Kings than you did with the Buffalo Sabres organization? But sure enough, yeah. Cal Peterson will get a shot. And I think that that competition, is it's gonna yeah. have to push the Kings to make those decisions. How much do we play Jonathan Quick at this tenure in his career? Or are we happy with whatever happens because 
we need the draft pick. Right, and I think the decision might be made for them because th there's a chance Quickness gets hurt again. And totally. yeah. It's something that I said, you know, probably five years ago, uh, that Quick, he was not going to age well because he is the most explosively athletic goalie of this generation. Bar none. And he's one of the smallest goalies in the league, and that's how he's, he's made up big. for it. Yeah, he's not big. Uh, he's a tremendous yeah. athlete, and uh, like he even I remember he told me this because he's a huge proponent of playing all sports. Like he was a running back. He played running back growing up. He played all these different sports. Great athlete. Uh, but the problem is just that style is so taxing. And now he's 33, so he's a guy mm -hmm. who I don't think I don't think his body's coming back. The decline has been pretty apparent, and I just think the style he needs to play to be effective is going to continue to tax his body and probably lead to more injuries. I hate being someone to predict injuries that feels so morbid, but just if you're looking at a guy who's been hurt a lot recently and plays a style that's hard on the body, pretty good chance it's going to happen again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that concludes our season preview. Hallelujah. 32 teams. Hallelujah. 32 teams, many hours. Uh, still 31, 31, eh? Yeah, it's well, 32. Seattle's not in the league Did I say yet. 32? Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, because uh, come on. Seattle will not make okay, the playoffs. Okay, Seattle's well, going to scout a lot of players this yeah. year, and they're going to—they're not going to make the playoffs. There are 32 NHL teams that are sort of in existence. There's only 31 in the league right now. 31 rosters. Yeah, we we previewed those 31 rosters. Hope you enjoyed it, and it's time to finally watch some actual games play out. And we'll be back with some just regular style podcasts very very soon. Thanks so much for listening to all these.